All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jess Bedard. I'm with Mikasa. So nice to see all of you today. And we're here to chat about federal grant writing. Before we dive in, I'll pass it over to Elizabeth to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Elizabeth from Mikasa, and I'm here to help support Jess here um, today. She did the bulk of the work on this, but um, I've got a few more years on uh, federal grant writing, reviewing, managing, and so I get to come along for the ride. Thanks for coming today. And I hope you all picked up that that just a few was cute. Elizabeth just celebrated her 23rd anniversary in this role, so she has much, much, much experience she's bringing to the table, and we are so lucky to have her here. Um, so today's webinar is really a part two in a series about grant writing. The part one, if you haven't already seen it, I encourage you to check it out. It's on our toolkit on the grant writing toolkit page. And that really focused more on the types of grants, namely federal versus foundations, which we'll touch on a little bit today. And, um, and really overviewed the sort of components of a grant and tips for writing, designing your project first, writing um, and doing reporting for grants. So in this conversation today, we're gonna be focused on federal grants and particularly competitive federal grants, federal discretionary grants, which we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, and so we'll be focused on sort of what the landscape of federal grants are, and then um, go through some of the components of federal grants and offer some tips. So I do not expect that anyone who doesn't already have uh, experience, maybe even extensive experience with federal grants is gonna walk away today feeling totally ready to take this on with no questions or reservations. But our hope is that this moves you a little closer to get the knowledge and the skills and the confidence to be able to pursue federal grants for your programs. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, oh, I almost forgot. Uh, I think that this is gonna um, be a full hour. As I was saying before we started, I'm, I'm not fully sure, but I do wanna encourage folks to ask questions either out loud or in the chat and uh, interrupt us as we go, because this is really only as useful as it is for all of you. So um, if you have needs or, or thoughts or you want to share a reflection or experience, I really encourage you to do that. And, um, and I will try to go slow and make space for all of you. And I just want to add that um, we try to mark this and um, Jess is usually the best at doing it. So I'm really pleased that I get to fill it in today, but that this is uh, another offering that comes directly out of your requests from the annual needs assessment. Um, so really important to remind you that what you ask for, we listen to and we try to deliver. Um, and so uh, this didn't come out of the air, it came from you. Yes. All right, uh, federal grant types, here we go. Um, so uh, this is a sort of breakdown of, this isn't really just federal grant types. We're gonna uh, sort of zoom out for a moment and think about the grant types uh, more broadly. So we've got federal grants up top, state grants in the middle. We're not really gonna talk much about those. We actually totally omitted them in the last conversation, but um, maybe we'll have a part three if y'all are interested and still with us. Um, and then uh, the foundations down below. We focused more on the foundations last time. I had actually uh, two folks come from foundations in Maine um, and talk about the foundation landscape, which was really rich. So again, I encourage you to watch that webinar if you haven't. We're gonna focus on the federal piece here. And so uh, there's the non-discretionary side on the left and then the discretionary side on the right. Most of our conversation is gonna be about the discretionary piece, but we thought it would be useful to um, describe what these terms mean and what the full landscape of federal funding looks like. So um, again, this is just a quick highlight uh, on the foundations piece before we dive fully into the federal. Just a, a quick reminder for those from last session, federal grants um, are different from foundation grants. Often they will have subsets that are sexual violence specific or anti-violence specific. Of course, in federal grants, you're competing nationally. So it's a much broader uh, sort of uh, scope of competition, but you're also often competing for higher amounts of funding, more likely to be funded repeatedly for multiple years. So it's it's more sustainable. Um, and foundations offer a bunch of other uh, advantages. Um, some may uh, be less competitive. They may have different sizes or scopes that fit your project needs. 
Um, they may be relational based. Um, they may have a focus that's very specific to what you need, or it may be very broad. So it's just a much uh, wider range of types of grant offerings. So again, we're gonna focus right on these grant types, these federal grant types, non-discretionary and discretionary. We'll talk about the non-discretionary first, and then the rest of our conversation will be about the discretionary ones. So discretionary grants are uh, available through a competitive process. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, they often fund what they call demonstration projects, which are projects that you know, identify and uh, implement promising practices, which then others in the field can replicate or that your own agency can continue with often non-discretionary uh, dollars. So the key here is that these discretionary grants are a competitive process, right? That, um, that any agency that fits the definition that is uh, an allowable applicant can apply. They're different from formula from non-discretionary grants like formula grants or set-asides. And I'm gonna show you a picture that's gonna hopefully illustrate that a little better for you. So these are the non-discretionary grants. So I would say that they're non-competitive, but that's not strictly speaking true, but they're not as cleanly competitive as the discretionary ones where if you fit the definition, you can go online and fill out an application, bada bing, you've applied. It's a little harder than that, but that's the sort of essence, right? With the non-discretionary um, uh, funding, there's sort of two types that are common in our work. And if this is two in the weeds for you and you're like, I wanted to come here to learn about how to apply for federal grants and this context is too much. I encourage you to just cover your ears for the next like three minutes uh, and then we'll come back out of the weeds and focus on something that's more tangible. Uh, so on the right hand side, we've got the formula grants. Those are um, uh, named aptly. They're uh, named that because they use a mathematical formula to determine which states get what amount of money. I just realized I missed the very top, which is often there's a federal law like the Victims of Crime Act, Violence Against Women Act, that then sets aside a certain amount of money. Uh, I just use the word set aside, but like that, that earmarks a certain amount of money for uh, a specific purpose, right? A specific type of work. So in formula grants, a mathematical formula is used to determine which states get what amount of money. Then money is passed to the states. And states make decisions about how to distribute those funding, that funding in accordance with uh, the needs of that funding source of the grant. And that's um, where we spend a lot of our time. So when you think about Mikasa doing funding advocacy, that's a lot of what we do. We work with the state to convince them that funding ought to be coming to your services with funds that are formula, but where the states get to decide what it is they're going to do with that, right? So um, so, you know, there are some where it's easier to make that case, like the Sexual Assault uh, Services Program, SASP, that's for direct services for survivors of sexual violence. It mentions rape crisis centers in the federal statute. It can go to other organizations, but that's their its primary function. Whereas the Social Services Block Grant does not mention sexual assault support centers. <laughs> it is to fund broad social services supports under a broad group of headings. And so those are the places where we have to really beg and plead um, in order to direct some of those funds in your direction. And we'll look in a minute to uh, about some of the ways that um, these decisions get made and where Mikasa can have input in that, in that, in that process. Um, on the left, you've got set asides, which, um, Unlike a formula grant, don't use a formula to determine how much each each area might get, but there's a specific amount of money that is earmarked for a specific territory or type of provider from a larger pot. So these funds may be available directly to the federal government, or they might be passed through the state. But at the, at the end of the day, either the federal government or its uh, agent through the state is responsible for making sure that the agency that's going to get that money is still able to fulfill the activities and goals that are outlined in that in that project. So and they're largely irrelevant for you ultimately because there are no straight sexual assault set set asides that are for sexual assault support centers. It just doesn't exist. Um, there is one for the coalition. It's a small one. Every coalition in the country gets a set aside that's our basic funding that um, mostly funds my time. So we can focus on this mainly then with the formula grants, but it could apply to either one. This one on the left, request an application to demonstrate uh, 
the projects mostly going to be used for formula grants, but is you know sort of there on the left. Um, other possible ways, and this is not all of the ways that states or federal governments might make decisions about how folks are how they're distributing the funds that are available to them. They may continue funding ongoing services. That certainly happens sometimes. Um, they may and and decisions about whether there needs to be an increase in that funding, right, uh, can be part of the advocacy that Mikasa might do. They may be assessing needs and and determining a distribution based on data, and that's where Mikasa might, uh, for example be looking at the data about your services, be assessing and, and shaping assessments about um, needs for crime victims in Maine more broadly and how you're, how, and then trying to help make connections about how the services you all provide connect to the needs of folks in Maine. Um, and then sometimes, and this has happened before, um, that money actually is actually made available through a competitive process, which then even though they are for sexual assault services, they may still be put sort of out to bid where different agencies can um, uh, apply to be providing the sexual assault services in that area. And it has actually happened in, I wanna say the last 10 years, Elizabeth, you can correct me on that, um, that you know, sexual assault service centers are applying for the funding that they've received for a long time. And the other folks in their area are also applying for that money. And so it's important to note that even though um, these are non-discretionary, which may mean to us non-competitive, there can be a competitive aspect to these and uh, that there's a lot of sort of complicated dynamics around advocacy and uh, continually proving that the services that you all provide are important, valuable, demonstrating that, that go into keeping this funding and expanding it. Because ultimately these non-discretionary and again, mostly formula grants are in the hands of the state and they get to make the decisions about what they wanna do with it. Um, and so um, we often think about these as our funds, but really they're not. Um, it's, it's always a matter of us trying to retain the funds and uh, you know, that, 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 that the state has chosen to allow us to have. All right, um, if there aren't questions on that and Maureen, if there, if there are questions, just let me know because I don't know if I can, oh, there's the chat. Um, we're gonna sort of dive out of the, uh, of the, well, I suppose we're going to come back and zoom back into the specific thing we're talking about here and get out of this rabbit hole and talk more about discretionary federal grants and what types are available that your center might apply for. So yep. Elizabeth? Great, so um, the major discretionary uh, grants that uh, providers in Maine have been successful in um, accessing are the direct Office of Violence Against Women discretionary grants. Um, and some of you are, um, I think, subcontractors um, under an OVW discretionary grant, maybe a campus grant, maybe a rural grant. Um, we, um, Mikasa holds a rural grant that funds um, three, of, uh, three of the groups of providers here. Um, legal assistance for victims grants. Um, you're familiar with those. I know that's, that's another category. Stop grants are, it's actually a little bit confusing because technically a stop grant is a formula grant. And so what happens is there's a formula by which each state is allocated stop dollars. So they will call it stop formula. But for our purposes, it's really a discretionary grant because what happens then when the stop dollars come to Maine, to the Department of Public Safety, it's a matter of folks competing in an RFP situation to get those funds. Um, and, and this year uh, in the victim services category, there was about $300,000 of funding available and there were $900,000 of grant applications for that 300, which is to say that is that pot is always competitive. And in fact, um, there are fewer dollars, there are more dollars in it this year than there, there will be in the future. And so it's only gonna get more competitive. Office of Victims of Crime Act grants. Um, there are a lot of discretionary grants over there around, about which we really don't know a whole lot. <laughs> so full disclosure, uh, one of our goals, Jess and I were just talking about this morning is to get a better handle on what they are, about how likely we're able to be competitive for them. Uh, you know, a little more detail on what has been funded in the past um, to help set, assess that on your behalf. Um, in addition, we're aware that there are some grants that are competitive through the center's National Center for D Disease Control and, um, and Prevention. 
uh, anyway, um, CD, the uh, national CDC. That's where your um, rape prevention education grants come through. That's a formula that comes through CDC to uh, actually to the CDC here and then gets passed over to another part of DHS and then gets passed through to us and then gets passed through to you. Uh, but there are also some other funds we believe that may be competitive. And I think actually in this next week, um, we have staff in our office who are gonna be meeting with, uh, with the feds on that to, to learn a little bit more about what's available and if we might have a chance at applying for some of those funds. Um, their grants.gov is a great resource to go in and um, search for what uh, solicitations are open, um, what the various kinds of programs are. Um, it's also um, a rabbit hole. Um, you know, I, I, you could spend a lot of time there um, to learn what mostly we're telling you, which is when it comes down to it, there are a gazillion grants, but the ones where you're going to likely be most successful are, are few. Um, and so just a warning, if you decide you wanna go down that rabbit hole, um, really read those RFPs closely uh, because sometimes it's there will be one award in the country and like, oh, we should think about that. Or actually it's only eligible for state government to apply for it. Or you have to be a research agency of a certain kind in order to apply for it. Um, so, you know, I often get excited that there's one that comes out fairly regularly about promising practices in sexual, uh, assault primary prevention. And I'm always like, yeah, let's do that one. And they're like, oh yeah, I remember what that is. <laughs> no, it's a bit, it's a major research grant. And like, that's not going to do what we want it to do. Um, not that it's not important, not that Muskie couldn't do a great job with it. And we always forward it over, but it's just not going to do what we want. So um, don't, don't get uh, too tempted by some of the titles, really make sure you dig in there. Still me, yeah. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, OBW federal discretionary grants, there are a whole bunch of them. Um, abuse in later life is one that we have applied for in the past um, with legal services for the elderly. Um, we actually held um, the, the, a previous version of the elder abuse um, grant at Mikasa for uh, a number of years. I think we had it for four years, um, supporting you all to do training around elder abuse in the communities. We haven't applied in a long time. A lot's changed about that program. It's probably worth thinking about again. There are a number of underserved population grants, um, which are eligible for organizations who primarily serve a particular underserved population. And so um, IRCM has received some of these grants over the years. I, don't, I can't remember what their current status is on it, but uh, Rook could certainly tell us for sure. Um, campus grants are another one where there have been a number of uh, projects over the years um, uh, where you typically um, a university, and in some cases a domestic violence um, resource agency has, has been the primary um, uh, grantee, and then uh, sexual assault support centers have been sub-grantees under those. Uh, let's see, um, encouraging arrest and enforcement is the is the grant that uh, primarily funds the violence intervention project down in, in Portland, if you're familiar with the program that was run by Faye Lupi and uh, now Jen Annis. Um, LAV is, is a, a grant that we've done really well with as a state. Um, actually, Mikasa had one years ago, um, but uh, Pine Tree Legal holds a number of them as do the DB projects. Rural, the rural grant, um, you know, we, Mikasa holds one, MCDV, I don't know if they were reawarded, but they've had one too, then that's primarily supported their child protective liaison program. Uh, disabilities grant, uh, we finally have gotten one of those as a sub grantee. We're so excited. Um, a project with Disability Rights Maine, highly competitive. I think there were seven awards nationally, I think. Um, we're really excited about that. It's going to be awesome. Uh, essay culturally specific. I know that um, IRCM has held one of those in the past. Um, tribal sexual assault services, um, our Wabanaki friends are eligible for uh, ditto tribal governments. There's a lot of information about these discretionary grants, um, beginning with nice little paragraphs um, on OVW's website, so you can learn more about those. And then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what's realistic. Um, you, your programming will fit under almost all of these. And then the question is, how likely are you to receive one? So we'll, we will talk more about that. And just so you all know, there are also examples of uh, some of Mikasa's completed OVW grants on the toolkit if you want to check them out. 
Okay, so OVC federal discretionary grants, as Elizabeth said, we know less about them, but I did some poking around into some of the types of solicitations and projects that they've been funding in the past, I think these are all in the past year. And so here are some of the examples of the titles of projects or the scope of projects that they've been funding. So services for human trafficking, preventing trafficking, improving law enforcement response, enhancing access to victim services, um, developing a better understanding of and resources for victims uh, of criminal justice system related harm, increasing options and expanding access for victims of crime. They certainly seem to have a broader scope than perhaps the OVW uh, funding sources in terms of rightness of fit for your agencies, our agencies to apply, um, but could be worth looking at and, and I suppose really uh, wait for us to check it out more to figure out um, how many of these types of solicitations that might be available would be a good fit for um, sexual assault programming. But if you're interested and you're feeling really ambitious, you can always check that out on the grants.gov website. And then if you do that, tell us what you learned because you'll save us some work. That's right. <laughs> All right, um, so we're gonna talk now about grant writing and submission. So again, we're sort of gonna go through a lot of the similar categories that we did in the first webinar, but focus on tips for the federal grant writing process. And as I sort of mentioned at the beginning, as we talked about the difference between federal grants and uh, foundation grants, foundations have a lot more variety in what the sort of processes or application processes look like. For federal grants, there's still some variety with the different funding sources, but there's a lot more streamlined. And so that means we have experience and tips to share that are really specific to these processes and technologies. Before we get into that, uh, you may recognize a slide from our first training. Um, gonna be a bit of a broken record here and say that uh, it's really important for, uh, for centers who are interested in, in pursuing grant funding to not start with, the, with searching for the funding or reading the application or um, writing, certainly not writing the application, but with the project that you're hoping to fund and with the change you're hoping to make. And so, uh, you know, uh, having a solid project with clear outcomes of what you hope is gonna change as, as a result of your work is in a really important first step because as ultimately when you're applying for a grant, you're going to them and saying, I have this important need in my community. I have this idea about how I can meet this need in my community. These are the resources I need to meet that need. And you're not going and saying, I just need $100,000. Now I've got to sort of make up what I'm going to do with that, right? So starting with the project that you want to get funded and the change you hope to make is really key. So some of the questions you can ask yourself to figure that out. What change are you hoping to make? How will you make that change? Who's going to be a part of helping you? And what will you need in order to do that? Funders can tell if you made up a project just to fit their needs. So it's really important that your project fits your mission and your priorities. And I know that this is hard because you're all, we are all so busy and particularly you all doing direct service. Uh, it can be really difficult, I know, to, to carve out time to be centering on your agency's priorities. And if you don't have that time set aside and you aren't clear on what your agency's priorities are, you may end up applying for grants or funding that actually does not align with your agency's values, priorities, capacity, the needs of your community, and it can have all sorts of negative consequences and actually sometimes do more harm than good. And remember, right, I would just add on that one that you know, I th again on the um, you know the, the on the funders who they can tell, um, you know, there's just a really clear difference between. Um, we did a community needs assessment three years ago. We determined that um, that we have a lack of services for elders in our community. So we've been working closely with the following three local organizations to better assess what the needs are on the ground with elders. And we realized that the top need was this. We've been working together on what that project looks like. And here we are coming, thank goodness, there's this funding source that's available for it. As opposed to, we have this really great project we wanna tell you about that's elder related. You know, you can just, you can just smell it. You can t smell what came out of the air and what is clearly driven by the needs that were in the community and have been assessed and planning and connections. All right, so 
at the risk of being uh, too repetitive. Once more, project, then grant. And so um, if you mix up these this order and you're applying for a grant without a solid project, other uh, Elizabeth gave a good example, uh, funders just may not choose you, right? Um, even if they do end up selecting you, you may have goals and activities that don't actually address your problem. And so even if you get funded, you aren't able to make the change you hope you might make um, uh, in service of your of your goal. Your budget might not be ever feasible because since the project was made up, the budget was made up and the prices weren't checked, which could then result in budget revisions, program changes to, to meet the budget that you um, that you submitted. Partners who you sort of named and you got to send an MOU, but you had never really partnered with them truly on the project, and they didn't actually have the capacity or maybe the interest or the ability to, uh, to partner on the project in the way that you might want and need for the program to be successful. And you may have goals that are just unachievable because they were just sort of created to answer a question or fill out a box. And that can be bad for morale as folks feel like they can't meet that goal and awkward as you're filling out your grant reports and you realize uh, you're just continually having to say, not even close, not even close, we were never gonna get close. Um, and finally, if you're not planning out your project in advance, then you're probably not also thinking about how you're going to sustain the impacts of your project and integrate those learnings into your work, which means even if you make a difference in those couple of years, there's not a path to, to, uh, to making lasting change as a result of that project. All right, a word on timing. Um, so typically, um, the OVW uh, solicitations for discretionary grants, the ones that we're most familiar with, come out in sort of more or less the same general time period. And what, what I mean by that is in a four to five month window. Um, and that's um, largely because uh, if anyone's familiar with the congressional bu budget process, uh, it can be a little bit unpredictable. And so um, those solicitations can't go out until those final appropriations have been made. Um, and then OVW is like scrambling and trying to get solicitation out after solicitation out. Um, and so they really, it really can be a wide range, but we generally have a sort of good idea about when they generally come out. Um, and there is information on, on the websites uh, for, for that. Not every um, solicitation comes out annually. Um, most do, but sometimes they also are like, uh, reworking a grant program, maybe combining it with another one, uh, it, you know, and particularly after a reauthorization of whatever federal act controls them. So that's a word on timing. Fit. Um, what, Jess, I think just used a phrase I really like, rightness of fit. Was that, was that it? Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. Um, so, you know, you want to start by really looking at what the purpose area is for the grant. Um, typically, uh, you know, a grant might be for sexual assault uh, victim services um, on its face. And then when you dig in a little deeper, it says, actually, what we want to fund are programs to enhance services for individuals with disabilities or X, Y, and Z. And so you're going to want to really look at that. And they can change from as often as year to year. Typically with OVW, it's a little bit like a longer on them, but um, but it really depends. Eligibility and likely of likelihood of success. Go straight. One of the first things I do is I go straight to the eligibility section. I'm like, oh, no, this one's only, only eligible for state government. <laughs> okay, <laughs> send that to DHS or, you know, put it in the trash. Uh, doesn't matter. I don't, it doesn't even matter what it's for. It doesn't, it's not going to uh, apply. And then whether or not you're truly competitive. So, you know, I have, am not aware of anyone, any sexual assault um, support center in Maine ever being funded on their own for an OBW discretionary grant. So if this is the moment where you feel sad and want to leave the webinar, you can do that. Um, but what I would say is what we have been really successful in doing is doing grants that serve a group of communities. 
Um, and in the case of our rural grant, it's not a it's not a nice group like this. It's a we did analysis about which rural communities were being the least served by their population by the sexual assault support centers and made a determination. There were three regions and that was what the application went with. Now, why is this? This is because on the national stage, we're competing with uh, you know, the the rape crisis center of lower Manhattan, who's serving, um, I'm going to just go with a few more survivors than we do a year. Um, so there are single programs that serve more survivors than we do as an entire state. Um, and so ultimately, as much as OBW might love our program, um, they're trying to make as much impact as they can. And so we really have to be thoughtful about acknowledging what our numbers are and working on programs that are really innovative and supporting survivors in a, in a you know, on sort of the front end way that typically, uh, you know, that, that's the extra edge that we have to have with these applications. And that is tricky because we really wanna make sure that we're not making up something in order to get the money. Um, and so, you know, the, our strongest grants are the ones that really do align and where we've got a new idea that we really wanna try out. There also is an advantage because sexual assault programs have been historically under, underfunded by the Office of Violence Against Women and by OBC. Um, and so one of the things that it is great is when it's a sexual assault only um, program, we do get a little, little bounce um, as we're trying to get those grants. So that's, that's great. Um, so how competitive, we talked about that. Um, again, looking at previously funded programs is a great way to assess that. Um, the budget range, is it gonna work? Um, does it does it work for the the span of the project you're thinking of? Um, and then there are often special requirements, um, some which just are too great of a burden for the project that you want to do. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've <laughs> I've had conversations over the years with some of our Wabanaki um, service provider friends. I think we may have friends on the phone today. Um, and uh, you know, talking about a possible grant, they're like, you know what? No, we don't want to. We don't want to deal with the headache of those seven different regulations that we're going to have to follow. And like, yeah, fair. <laughs> um, and I think you got to do a really honest assessment about what it's going to cost your agency. All right, getting ready. Um, all the old solicitations they don't often change a ton. From year to year so you can easily look at a previous solicitation and practice and figure it out whether or not like how would this go would it, what it would look for me like for me so that when the new solicitation is dropped you've already answered those questions uh, once it is released read every single word every single word we have been we have been caught up on some of these where we've done a bunch of work and that got, then got to appendix seven and in it it said every state but maine may apply okay i might have made that one up but but something that was like oh no we just put in all this work and we we can't even oh no so for reals um and then really make a careful checklist you know, OBW is lovely and they have a nice checklist oftentimes at the back of the solicitations and it doesn't include everything. You know, I go through a hand write on every solicitation, a, a particular little requirement, you know, and make sure you address blah, blah, blah. I put a line under it and then I put a checkbox by it because there are so many little pieces and any anytime you're doing a grant review, the easiest way to say, oh no, we wish we could fund you, but you didn't follow all the instructions. That's the easiest way to go from, you know, 7,000 proposals to 100. Um, so that's really criti critical. Um, be thoughtful about which grants fund your time working on and applying for grants. Oftentimes, most of our funding does not really allow for that. So if you're SAS funded, if you're VOCA funded, you can't be billing your time to those funding sources as you're putting together these grants, most likely. And that's a that's a real nuanced thing. And feel free to come and chat with us, uh, talk, chat with me um, more about the ins and outs of various funding sources if you want to talk about that. And if there are any pre-application information section, sessions, go to them. You're going to get some information, but you're also going to, in the questions, get additional information that you now, as a grantee, potential grantee, are privy to, whereas all the other ones who didn't attend aren't. So again, it's another way that you might get a little bit of a bounce um, as, you're, as you're moving forward with that application. All right, staying organized. 
critical. Again, detailed timeline is another piece that we got it. We got to get down. We need to know what staff is doing what. And I'll I'll say we. I'm saying this, and we work so hard each time, and then we have you know run into a, a mistake or an error. Uh, you know, I just Julie, I'm going to pick on you. Um, so last time we were putting together a, um, a discretionary grant application, I was doing a, a review, a final review of, a, of a one of the budget forms, and it was half done. Um, it had all the numbers, but no explanation beside the pieces. And I was like, what up, Julie, you haven't finished this budget piece. And she was like, oh, no, no, that's the, it's a narrative. That's a narrative piece. That should have been Sarah. <laughs> oh, Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's let's get that done, right? Um, but you got to be really clear about who's responsible for making sure that every single one of those boxes is checked, um, and set aside the, enough time to do it. Let everyone know it's grant season, or that you're working on a grant, um, because during that time in our office, when we're writing those, you know, this last time we had. Two, we were writing and two, we were co-writing. No, two, we were co-writing and one, we were writing at the same time. And several of us were like, that was all we were doing. Um, and so we needed the space to do it and, and staff gave it to us. Um, again, last few pages often include a checklist, but it's not always all the things. So just make sure that you're really picking out even those tiny little pieces that are in the narrative. All right. Um, so this first one is one of my favorite general tips. I force everyone to do this. So when we're writing a grant narrative, there are often sort of headers, you know, section two needs to include information about blah, 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 blah. And so what we do is we cut and paste that right in and then work on that section there. That's really important to keep it in all the way to the end, because what happens is you need your editor, your second set of eyes, your third set of eyes, and probably your final reader to know what the requirements are. It is not uncommon that I, as the final reader, are reading that block and are like, oh, you got five out of six. Where's, where's the explanation? Where's the, this part? You know, and oh, no, I didn't notice that that didn't happen. Um, so put that in there, keep it, and then remember to take it out before you submit it. Um, but really, really helpful. Um, each section typically needs to stand on its own and not depend on other sections. That kind of varies from grant to grant, um, but just be on the lookout for that. Use the language in the solicitation back to them. They say, please describe the geography of your community. You say, the geography of our community is, that helps the grant reader check the box. Did they do this thing? If, if you start with Maine is a beautiful place that's full of mountains and coastlines. In fact, the coastline is longer than California's when you take into the consider the Asian, the tidal zones, they're gonna be like, this is lovely. I don't know what's going on. We know that we're talking about the environment in which we live and work and that that's an important factor. Yeah, they don't know that though. So be really careful. Tell it, it tells you read them and it makes it easy to score. So great. Grant sections. Um, so as just said, the ones that we're most familiar with are the Office of Violence Against Women discretionary grants. They typically have sections that are more or less the same, um, but they also vary. Um, so we're gonna just give you the most common pieces and go from there. The abstract is almost always there. That gives you the, the basic idea. Um, we uh, disagree, um, uh, many disagree on when you write it. Um, I think probably if there's a right answer is you write it first and last. You write it to say, yep, I know what this is generally gonna be about, this is, and then as you work through putting together a really compelling application, things will shift a little bit. You'll come up with a little better wording. It'll get a little bit sharper in your view about what this project is. Then you wanna come back and revise that abstract. Oh, this is me. Um, okay, so the statement of need and the purpose of your proposal. Um, so this is where you're really making the case for why, uh, why your community, why this funding, why now. And so uh, the first thing I'll say is don't assume that the reviewer will read your abstract first. And I say that because I was just a reviewer 
on a federal grant. And the, the abstract shows up on a totally different place than, than the statement of need. And so it's very easy if you have saved the, the download to actually have not been able to read the abstract because you know, you've printed it out and you've got a paper copy. And so you really want this to stand by itself and not assume that it's going to just build off of your abstract. So um, don't assume they read that first. Um, your statement of need and your project description are, are, are weighted the most, okay? So they're the most important in terms of quality. So you should try on every component, but know that in terms of scoring, these are going to um, really drive the score you're going to get. Um, you want to start with the broad need, then winnow down. So when I say the broad need, what I mean is, uh, let's say you're writing one on, I'll take the example of the one I just uh, was a reviewer on, uh, uh, pet shelters for domestic violence, right? So you may start with the sort of broad issue, which is um, there's a lack of resources in the country for um, for animals and folks uh, who experience domestic violence for them to stay together. And uh, you know th this is a this is an issue that is driving folks to stay in abusive relationships because they worry about what's going to happen to their pet, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you're using some data to back up like why this is a problem really broadly. And then you're sort of coming in um, more specifically to maybe your community. This is showing up in our town, in the area we serve. And then you're wanting to come into to your agency itself. So how does this, how would this expand or connect with the programming that you provide now, and how is it meeting a gap? Because if your agency already has a pet advocate, you know, shelter and program to meet pets' needs, what is the project actually doing, and how is it going to expand or meet a need in your community? So you want to be really clear. You want to make a case, right, about why this need, why, why broadly, why this need, why in your community, why for your agency. Uh, okay. And then um, qualitative and quantitative data can help ensure that you hook the reader, right? So certainly using data for those sort of broader needs is a really simple way to go. You can find national research that illustrates the problem, the prevalence of sexual violence, the impact of sexual violence, right? And then um, using data from your own community makes it even richer. And using uh, qualitative data, stories, de-identified stories, can really make it a, a rich example that can help someone understand and really see and feel the problem that you're experiencing. So the project overview is what you're gonna talk about, how, where you're gonna talk about what's gonna be done with the funding. So let's say you get the funding, how are you actually going to implement the project itself? So you wanna clearly describe the activities of the project and when you're talking about the goals and the objectives, having in a table can make it a lot easier to read. Um, I'm trying to decide if we, no, I did not have another slide on this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about goals and objectives. Oh, oh outputs and outcomes. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that. Um, so an outsider should be able to read the project overview and have an understanding of what you'll do and how you'll do it. So really check all of your assumptions about this. I encourage you, particularly in this section, but also really in the whole grant, to have someone who doesn't do your work, read it and have them tell you if it makes sense to them, if it's intuitive. It should be pretty clear after reading the, the statement of need, how you're going to meet that need based on the activities that you outline here. It should be really clear and intuitive. Um, and you wanna make sure you're identifying outputs and outcomes when you're in your sort of goals, objectives, outcome, out, out, output and outcome in, in a big table. Um, we decided it was a little too in-depth to, to do a, like a sort of full tangent into what are goals, what are objectives, but I'll just spend a moment on outputs and outcomes and then encourage you to check out the toolkit for a video on creating goals and objectives. Um, it's sort of a funny, uh, a funny 80s video, maybe 90s video, um, but it's, it's also very informational. And also know that I'm here as support if you want to help think about goals, objectives, and output, outcomes, outputs and outcomes for your project. But essentially, when we think about an outcome, we're thinking about what the change is that's going to be made. And when you're thinking about an output, you're thinking about the way that you can count the work that you've done. So for example, um, an output might be that we uh, served 10 people. And an outcome might be that the people who we served experienced greater healing, right? So the outcome is the change you're making and the output is the number of things you did or the number of people you reached. Um, there's also a a uh, big chart 
on your on the toolkit that has a bunch of performance measurement tools and in there is a an example of all the potential uh, ways that you might count outputs and outcomes related to your program intervention prevention and CACD based on what's in empower so I encourage you if you're like I'd like to sort of think about this a little more or even outside of your grant be thinking about outputs and outcomes um, there's a bunch of potential ways you can sort of get that with the data available to you now Okay, and the competencies. So this is where you're talking about why your agency specifically. Um, so there's a bunch of parts to this prompt. I encourage you to, as Elizabeth said, read really thoroughly, make sure you're answering each component. Um, I encourage you to include staff roles and competencies as well as agency roles and competencies um, and to attach job descriptions and resumes for even for existing positions, even if not required, um, if it's allowed. So I will say on the one that I just was reviewing, um, I don't think it was disallowed. And I heard people on multiple occasions say that they were increasing the score they gave because someone attached a job description, even though it wasn't required and it helped them understand the project. And so um, just think if you can provide more information within what's allowable, that can be helpful. Um, and so again, just on this, this middle one, staff roles and competencies. So you're wanting to make the case of why your agency is expert enough, has experienced enough, has the skills and tools and resources to, to successfully complete the activities that you've outlined in your, in your proposal and to meet the goals of the project um, and why the people who actually make up the agency have the expertise, right? So you're wanting to answer that from both angles. Data and evaluation. Um, so this is where you're gonna wanna track, describe how you're gonna track the required data uh, that's that's part of your reporting for, uh, for the grant and that'll be outlined in the solicitation itself. But you also wanna make sure you're um, reflecting on how you're going to evaluate the program that you're outlining itself. So how are you actually going to figure out the outcome, right? Did it meet the goals that you're hoping to meet? Because the required data that it's going to ask you to track is uh, really not outcome-based, right? It's output-based. It's going to ask you the number of people served, by which demographic, by which victimization. And you have the method to track all of that. For those of you who use EmpowerDB, that's all in there. But, but really what you want to also spend some time talking about is how you're going to measure the impact of the work. And I would make the case, um, perhaps it's my job to make this case, that doing this is not really just to increase your likelihood of getting this grant, but it's also part of actually ensuring that the work that you're doing and that you're spending all this sort of time and resources into is really making the difference in your community that you are hoping to make. And if it's not, for you to be able to pause and change, adapt to the program, learn, keep going, evaluate again, right? Um, uh, I encourage you to be specific. So if you talk about how you want to evaluate that people had, uh, in my example, increased healing, how are you going to actually know that they had increased healing? So saying we're going to evaluate this goal using a survey, we distribute the survey after uh, to each client every eight weeks, provide them an opportunity, these are the methods of distribution, it's really going to be helpful for people to know that you have a robust plan. Um, and then include how the data are monitored to ensure accuracy. And that's one of the requirements in that section. So we're running really short on time. We've got a lot more to cover. So I'm just going to skip right over this budget um, document. Uh, we'll send out the PowerPoint afterwards. You can have a look at it. And also just call Julie. Um, Julie can tell you all the things you need to know about just grants and budgets and all the mistakes we've made over the years. Attachments, um, make sure that if they're allowed, they often aren't, that you're referencing those in your narrative. It's really important so that people know to go and find this cool thing that you have in there and how it relates to the project that you're doing. Finally, the, on the final review piece, and um, this is a part I feel pa passionately about, maybe it's um, maybe it's because it's the one I'm responsible for, so I, I have to think about it the most, but um, ideally you're having someone who hasn't read it before um, you know, and who can look at it objectively, um, who hasn't caught up in all of your days of ins and outs on the program. Um, 
be really careful about those changes I just mentioned before with the abstract. You know, you might make a little change during the grant writing process that doesn't get reflected in the abstract or that they don't line up. I just reviewed a set of grants where this happened repeatedly and it was a real problem. Um, and even more often reviewing the budget against what's said in the narrative. I can't tell you how many times we've written a grant that we're like, we are gonna fund two humans to do the following thing. And then Julie goes through and does the whole budget. And she's like, we can only afford one and a half people. And then we don't remember to get in there and change that in the narrative because someone's doing the budget and someone's doing the narrative. It's not until the end where like, oh, whoops. Oh, and we completely removed out that piece because we didn't have enough money for it. Um, so that's a really important piece. Um, and then remember to review, you know, take out those headers um, that are just reminders for you and triple check that page limit because in many of these grants, if you go a word over, they toss it. And that will may mean that you miss one of the requirements. Submissions, um, again, go talk with my friend, Julie. Um, she's great with grants.gov. Um, just to say it is not intuitive for many people. Um, Julie's special. Um, and so if you ever do this, please, please, please do not wait until the last day. Um, there may be federal glitches. There may be, you may lose your power. Uh, you may struggle with it more than you thought you were going to to upload all the things. Then there's the waiting. These grants are really competitive. Sometimes you don't get them. Um, we, I know that and recently uh, helped support around the edges on a grant that I thought was super duper awesomely amazing. Um, and even though like there'd be only 10 in the country, I thought it was gonna be funded. And Rook, I am still mourning. Um, I cannot get over uh, Main Transnet not getting that grant. Um, so be realistic and also understand that even if you have a really fabulous grant, you're competing against the nation for other fabulous programs. So just something to keep in mind. If you don't get it, find out why not so that you can do better next time. Grant reporting, just very, very, very briefly. Um, what's worth remembering is that your likelihood of getting the next grant depends on how well you report on this. You have to think about your grant reporting as an integral part of your next application because they're gonna look at your performance. They're gonna say, you're late on reporting. These other people were not late on reporting. Ooh, these people gave us really interesting stories as part of this report. This one was just kind of boring. I didn't get a feel for it because oftentimes that grant administrator has some role in the grant process. So that is important. Um, also, there's the issue of informal and formal reporting. And this is something we don't always do a great job with the feds. We do a great job with the state on this. But a lot of the forms that are reporting, like you don't really get enough feeling for it. But dropping an email every once in a while to your federal grant officer and said, God, we had a great training today. I saw people's faces light up. And also here are a couple of snapshots from the eval. That is gonna make a huge difference in the way they're thinking about this project. So thinking about that as a stewardship piece of a grant is something that's given us an advantage over the years. Shh, don't share it with everyone. Um, all right. Uh, I think we should save time for questions, Jess, and we can come back if no one has things to do. How, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I love it. Because we got six minutes. I know, I know. Ooh, sorry, guys. What to say about grants. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for, for sticking with us this long. i uh, wondering if anybody has questions. It's a lot. I think a thing I would just share is, you know, this wasn't to scare you. Um, I could I can imagine where it actually might feel like that on the other end. Like, like I remember there used to be um, a trainer at the safe advisory or at the safe training who would do this whole thing about how incredibly complex um, peds cases were in order to convince uh, folks that they should never do them. 
<laughs> and this is not what this presentation is, but it is to say it's really nuanced. Um, but what we're hoping is that in the coming years, we're going to be doing together more of these applications. We'd love to build a cohort of you all to help be identifying those grants, to be linking them in needs that you have when the solicitations come by, you know, reviewing them now and saying, gosh, you know, I think we've got an elder project that would be awesome. Um, you know, that kind of thing is, is what we need you to be partners on. And, you know, this is not to say you shouldn't go ahead and apply for a federal grant yourselves. I'm, you know, we will support you in it all the way. Um, but it can be hard um, as a single agency, as I said, and being competitive. Um, so I think the short of what we want to share is we are here to talk about these and to kick around ideas and, and to support you in however you want to proceed with federal grants. All right, well, I'll quickly go over these resources and, and we can take us to the end and we'll send out the, as Elizabeth said, um, this PowerPoint. And so you can sort of read more about these, but these are, you know, we, we put a lot of the content, the meat of the content in the words. So you're gonna be able to get that value. Um, so resources, the VAWA MEI website and VAWA MEI themselves are a great resource. Don't ask me what MEI stands for, but you could ask Elizabeth that question. There's a link. <laughs> to that website on the Grants Toolkit, seeing a theme here. The next resource is the Grants Toolkit page. So you could check that out. Um, there's a bunch of resources there and example projects. If you've worked on a federal discretionary grant or frankly, any other grant, and you uh, would like to share um, the, the finished grant that you've got, we would love to host it on our Grants Toolkit page so that other folks can learn from it. Um, so just be in touch with me if that's the case. And then reach out to Mikasa staff for support. And I'm going to um, put this up. This is the contact information for Elizabeth, um, who's of course here with us today, and Sarah, who is on vacation, but is actually uh, the person who does the bulk of our grant work in the office. And so she's also a great resource for all of you. And I previously said, Julie, um, on if you want to talk through the way these budgets are built and how to do, um, how to manage all that. Yes, talking through budgets, finance, reach out to Julie. And um, there's also, uh, just so you all know, like budget examples, uh, really, really well fleshed out budget examples on the grants toolkit that Julie's made for all of us. So um, that's a wonderful resource. I just put in the chat um, a link to a two or three minute survey. We'd love to hear from all of you about how this webinar met your needs or didn't, how we could do better. The feedback you provide is really helpful for um, Elizabeth and I to grow as trainers and for us to make sure that we're um, developing training materials that are effective and, and really meet your needs. So we'd love you to take just a couple of minutes uh, to fill that out. And uh, Maureen will send it out with the PowerPoint as well. But a big thank you to all of you for joining today. And if you have any other questions, just reach out to us. Um, happy almost Friday. I hope you all have lovely weekends. Yeah, thanks.